Episode 81, Three Positive Shifts for Better Communication with Your Teen with Lindsay Law. Welcome to Latter-day Life Coaches, the podcast where each episode is a conversation between me, Heather Rackham, and one of my amazing coach colleagues. Each coach here is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and certified through the Life Coach School. Together, we have one main goal, helping you live your best life no matter what. You ready for this conversation with the coach? Here we go. It's a pretty normal desire as a parent to want our children to be happy. While often well-intended, not allowing our children to experience emotions that are outside of what we would deem as happy can create self-doubt and insecurity. On today's podcast, Coach Lindsay Law gives three shifts parents can make in their communication with their teen so that they can help their teens feel validated and accepted in their emotions. And as with most coaching tools, these shifts will not only increase a teen's confidence, but a parent's confidence as well. Okay, folks, I get to talk today with Coach Lindsay Law, and we actually just got off from doing an Instagram live together. So we get to spend, gosh, quite a bit of time with one another today. And I'm excited for you guys to get to spend some time with her. Lindsay, as we get started, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you? Yes, sure. Um, so I am a mama of six and a homeschooling mom and also a youth life coach. And I help teens and tweens embrace self-love and confidence so that when those hard things come, they have those tools and they're ready to handle them. So, and do you want me to tell you a bit about my story? I would love you to. I think it's fun for people to hear how you even became yeah. a coach or why well, you and became I, a coach. I feel like this is a good group to share it with because it was kind of a spiritual experience for me. Mm-hmm. So that might, you know, resonate yep, with this someone. is the place for that. This then. Is the place. <laughs> I can't say that to everybody, but yep, I know. Yeah. So a couple of years ago, I started living some dreams in my life. Uh, we moved into a motor home with our kids, rented our house out, drove across Canada. We're from Canada went from ocean to ocean and just started doing some things that were just different, you know, getting away from the nine to five job. And we moved across the country and I just had this desire to share the joy of living dreams and like, not just kind of getting stuck in like the safe life, right? Like Mm -hmm. just what, you know, and what feels comfortable and just staying there. And because I started doing a lot of uncomfortable things and as much as it was hard, it was also completely amazing. And so I started thinking about this business I was going to start. Anyway, I woke up one morning and I had this impression, you need to be a life coach. And I was like, okay. And so I started looking things up and exploring that. And um, anyway, in the end, I met one of my friends had said she just became a life coach. I started working with her. It blew my mind. I was like so into it. And then because I had teens and tweens and navigating this whole um, idea of I'm enough for myself and for my kids, I kind of shifted my focus with my life coaching to wanting to help teens and tweens really be able to see their value, to love themselves for where they were. You know, I had kids who were struggling with that and really I wanted to be able to help kids to be able to live their dreams, you know, in the future and, you know, accomplish their goals and not feel so bad about themselves all the time. And I came from a place as a youth where I I was kind of a perfectionist, you know, I had to get the top grade and, and I spent a lot of my life feeling anxious and beating myself up. And once I explored and understood some of these life coaching tools, it changed everything for me. And even though I was doing a lot of cool things, living some dreams, it was still kind of under this cloud of anxiety and beating myself up. And I knew that I wanted something different for my kids. And I knew it was possible 
for them to learn these skills and these ideas from a much earlier age than I did. And also through this journey and helping my own children, life coaching helped me to be the mom to them, to help them accept themselves by offering to them so much acceptance. And it came through life coaching and studying different things that I was able to discover that there was some really key points in the way I communicated with my kids that really said to them, Hey, you're enough. I accept you. You're okay. Just the way you are. And it's those tools that I'm going to share with you today that have a really changed the way I communicate with my kids, which makes me feel so much more confident as a mom, because I know that I'm showing up in the best way I know how. And I, and I don't wonder if I'm saying the right thing. And also I know that I'm creating this environment for them. And now, although unperfectly, like I don't do it perfectly, but I'm able to create an environment for them, environment for them that they're more likely to accept themselves. They're more likely to see their value. And of course I can't make them like see their goodness. But it really, it really came home to me when I had a daughter who was struggling to see her value and I would come in and I'd say, no, you're wonderful, but look at this. You're so good at this. And you're so good at this. And everyone thinks you're wonderful and I love you and you're wonderful, but she didn't see it. And me just continuing to tell her wasn't helping. And so I had to really discover how to actually help her come to that place And of course I can't do it for her, but I can make it easier for her. Mm -hmm. And so that is my passion is to help parents and teens get to this place of love and acceptance and confidence for teens and youth. And that comes from helping teens and youth, like specifically talking to them and coaching them with their thoughts and emotions, but also helping parents create an environment that those thoughts come more easily. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that's it's such yeah, a my story. Thank you for sharing that. And I think it's so, it's so good for us to hear people's stories because it's just like everybody else's story, right? We, we find ourselves in, in each other's stories and it helps us connect. I, I'm interested though, before I can move forward, I want to know how, what the age of your kids are like your youngest to your oldest. <laughs> yeah. So my oldest is about to turn 18, which is okay. kind of blowing my mind mm-hmm. <laughs> because I also have a one-year-old. Okay. And so, so I had my first four kids kind of closer together and then I had like a four and a half year break and a four and a half year break. And these two amazing little caboose babies that were wanted and planned, but just the way life worked out, they just ended up being kind of spaced out. And the fun thing about that is that my older kids are like just gaga over these two younger so ones fun to watch and I bet. so helpful. And like, yeah, seeing my 17 year old with my one year old always just brings so much joy to my mother heart. So, yeah. oh, that's yeah. so fun. It's, it's so a fun, fun group. It's, it's crazy, but we have a lot of fun together. Busy, busy life, busy households. So much yeah. fun. <laughs> and thank you for sharing that. As you were saying, you know, you had a daughter that was struggling to see her value and to love herself. And, and as parents, we are usually pretty good at being able to point out all those things, but you know, as a parent, as an adult, like if somebody says, Hey, you look good today. And you don't think you do. You just brush off what they say. You don't believe it. And not even just that, like not even brush it off. But sometimes if we don't believe that our brain actually tells us the the opposite. So when, so when I say to my daughter, you're amazing, her little brain who doesn't believe that is like, no, you're not, you're not amazing. And so actually, instead of reinforcing, like I, as a parent, I'm thinking I'm reinforcing for my daughter that she's amazing, but what I'm actually doing is reinforcing the negative thought. And so I'm not saying just to be clear, I'm not saying don't say nice things to your kids. Don't praise them, but your communication needs to be more than just focusing on all the great things they do and all the positive things they do. I'm saying, right. 
that's a part of it. But if that's the only part, and if their brain is already believing a lot of negative things about themselves, it may actually be counterproductive is what I'm saying. Yeah. I just, I bring that up because it, because we understand that we, I I mean, we've experienced that, right. When somebody says something to us and we don't believe it and we just like, whatever, it doesn't mean anything. And it sometimes is counterproductive, makes us feel worse. And imagine what that's like in a teenager's brain who doesn't have even some of the skills and most of adults don't even have the skills either, but you know, their brains are already crazy because of hormones and all the other things. So it's kind of a crapshoot, actually. Sometimes don't you feel well, like it's like, well, yeah. where and, do you and go? And the thing, the thing is, is like our brains, like they run on these de- default programming, right? Mm-hmm. And we think, well, our our kids are supposed to be happy, and it's our jobs as moms to make them happy. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know a mom who doesn't have some of that programming, right? Yeah. Even if, like, when we intellectually look at it, it's like, well, no, of course we know our kids are going to be sad sometimes. Of course we know it's not our job, but there is some programming in there. Like, I know there is for me that it's like, I want my team to be happy. I can fix this, I can make them happy. But unfortunately, with our excitement or our energy in their happiness, again, it kind of has the opposite effect Mm -hmm. because then they've got this pressure of being happy. And when they're not happy, they feel like they're doing something wrong. They feel like there's something bad. And so really being aware of what your thoughts around your child's emotions are, right? Like if you notice that you have this like need, and this is going to be one of our first kind of shifts we're going to talk about. If we have this need for your child to be happy and that when they're not, you're trying to fix that or make it better or tell them all the reasons why they should be happy. That is not communicating acceptance to them, which is a ripple effect, right? Into, you know, negative thoughts. So there's three shifts I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about first, like what our brain kind of usually defaults to And I'm basing this on my brain and a whole ton of other parent brains I've talked to guesses are you're in there. And then we're going to talk about how you can shift the way you talk to your teen to help them feel accepted by you. And why that's important is because when they feel that acceptance, that what they're experiencing is okay, what they're thinking is okay, what they're feeling is okay. They're far more likely to accept themselves. And when they're feeling that self-acceptance, there's less room in there for that negative self-talk, those unhelpful thoughts that beating themselves up. And what we do is when we make these shifts is we model for them how they could treat themselves in their own brain. Mm -hmm. So that's why these shifts are so important is because for one communicates acceptance. And the other beautiful thing is When we're communicating that acceptance to our kids, we are also creating such a deep level of connection with them. These are the conversations and these are the way we talk that create that connection. And as we know with relationships, like connection is key for building that relationship, right? Mm -hmm. And so acceptance, connection, and then also modeling for them how they can treat themselves or how they can kind of talk to themselves in their own brain. So the first shift is moving from fixing, which I kind of just talked about to validating. And I have a couple examples to share. So oh, good. I love examples. Yeah. So again, like we, we come into these parents and I can really see this because I have a one-year-old, right? She's a baby. She, when she cries, like that's her letting me know there's a problem or she's uncomfortable or she needs something. And so as we start out as parents, that's how our kids start communicating to us. It's with crying, right? And so we're like, oh, there's a problem. I need to fix something. (laughs) And so it's no wonder that we're still trying to do that when they're teenagers, right? They were reinforced. Very well trained. Very Very well trained. trained. The baby cries. It's a problem. We fix it. Boom. Done. (laughs) Diapers change for many reasons, on. right? We feel bad for them. Plus we might go crazy if we have to listen to that for <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. And there's a very good reason that that like pattern exists, right? That's mm-hmm. not a problem, 
But what we need to know is that as our kids grow, we also need to shift a little bit and, and definitely hopefully before they're teenagers, but it's okay if you're learning this now and your kids are teenagers too. So again, our kids are sad. So for example, let's say your kid comes to you and says, I'm really worried about my test tomorrow. So if you're in mom, fix it. My kid needs to be happy mode. You're going to say, oh, but you've studied so hard. You're going to do just fine. Don't be worried. You don't need to be worried. And so we think that we're being helpful because we're like, oh no, you're fine. You've got this. We're being encouraging, but what we're actually doing is dismissing what they're actually feeling and experiencing. And in a way we're communicating to them that what you're feeling and thinking right now is not okay. And I know as parents, you're not saying that, but this is when we, when we dismiss, we try and make them happy and fix it. That's what we're communicating. And so it's like, I don't accept you right now as a worried person about your test. Let's fix this and then move on. And again, we're not doing this intentionally. That's our default brain just going there. It's okay. Just notice it. But then what you can learn to do once you've kind of noticed that is learn how to validate. Now I I've heard the word validate through my life and I'm like, okay, you repeat back what someone says. That was kind of my understanding of validation. I have a much deeper understanding of validation and I'm going to share some of those key points with you. So the really important thing to understand about validation is that we're communicating to the other person that we see them and we hear them and that we don't actually have to agree with them. And I think this is where we get stuck as parents is that we think if we validate our kids, we're telling them that we agree with what they're saying or doing. And that is not the case. So for example, in this, I'm worried about my test example in, instead of, you know, that previous example saying, Oh no, don't be worried. We can say, you know what, when I was a kid, I used to be really worried about tests too. Lots of people get worried about tests. We're normalizing that for them. We're saying, Hey, I experienced that too. And then we can say, Hey, Is there something particular that you're worried about? So when I validate, what I try to do is make a statement that says, Hey, what you're thinking and feeling right now is okay. And then I like to follow it up with a question that opens up conversation. So an open-ended conversation, like, tell me more about that. Like, why do you think that's bugging you? Like what's going on for you? Like just some way of just opening up conversation And, and that instead of shutting them down, like in the fix it situation, we're opening it up for conversation where they could say, well, you know what? There's this one part in my math curriculum that I just don't understand. Like, and then you're like, Hey, like, why don't we take a look at it? Right. Whereas when we're kind of shutting them down and telling them not to be worried, that might not come up. They might not feel like they can share that with us. And so not only have we created connection and acceptance. Also, we've, we may open up like an opportunity to solve a problem for them and to help them. And so that's why it's so important to do this shift. And again, it takes practice. You're not going to be perfect at it right away because again, your brain is so used to fixing and my kid has to be happy. And so what I do to help myself to move from this fix it mode to validate mode is I just, when my kids come to talk to me about something, I kind of have this little mantra in my head. I'm like, I see you, I hear you. And that helps me to just move into that space. And, and the other thing that parents come back with to me with is like, well, yeah, but like, if they're doing something like, okay, like I have a kid that will like throw something. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, we can validate the thoughts and the feelings that led to the throwing. So like, I'll say, Hey, like it's okay to feel upset. It's not okay to throw things in our house. And it's, and you can separate those instead Mm -hmm. of feeling angry for the action. You can say, Hey, Hey, like I acknowledge that what you're feeling right now is very real and it's okay. Like it's okay to feel what you're feeling, but in our house, we don't throw. Let's talk about this. What's going on for you? What's upsetting you right now? And again, that opens the conversation 
we don't have to let them just get away with everything or, you know, do those things. We can say, Hey, that's not okay, but let's talk about where that's coming from. What's bothering you right now. And so, yeah, such an important shift. And I I think it's so, so simple and so basic, right? I love that you just basically put it into two words, see them, hear them. And, and the other two words that I heard you say was normalize it and start a conversation, which is basically the same thing, seeing them, hearing them, normalizing it, having a conversation. And like, that just is something my brain can grab onto. Yeah, totally. And it's kind of the beginning of learning to process their own emotions. Because when we process an emotion for one, we're like maybe labeling it, we're acknowledging that it's okay, that that's what we're experiencing. Mm -hmm. And then we're kind of exploring it a bit. And so, you know, depending on where you are at as a parent in terms of processing emotions, that can be a building block for helping teaching them how to process it. Like, Mm -hmm. oh, like it looks like you're feeling really sad right now. Like, where are you feeling that? you know, and just like helping them learn to explore their own emotions Mm -hmm. instead of saying, Oh, don't be sad. Like we don't want our kids to be sad, but if we tell them not to be sad, guess what? They're going to be more sad. (laughs) I'm laughing because if I ask my kids questions like that, like that's when they're like, stop, don't try to coach me. Stop. I know. (laughs) I know. And our, our poor kids, like the kids of coaches, like they're like, seriously, mom, stop coaching me. And so I do have to be careful about the questions I ask because they can see me move into like, they're on to us, man. They're like, (laughs) they're on, (laughs) but I mean, I think it can start to be more natural. And the thing is part of the reason it doesn't feel natural to them is because they're so used to us, like trying to fix them and make them happy. So they're like, what is going on? Yeah. And, and again, it's going (laughs) to feel awkward at first. Like it probably will. It's going to feel mm-hmm. awkward to like ask these questions and, and, and you don't have to say like, Oh, tell me where you feel in your body. Like, like <laughs> that's maybe like a later conversation, right? Just saying, <laughs> Hey, I've felt that before. Do you want to talk about it? Like it can be so simple. Yeah. Acknowledge it's okay that you're feeling that way. Do you want to share more about that with me? Why yeah. is that bothering you? Like, and that just can be so simple. So Love it. Okay. That's shift number one. Yeah. And so the second shift, shift, yeah, is moving from a result focused to process focused. And really, I say that just to kind of make it clear, but really in the end, what we're doing is we're redefining success and failure for our kids. So for example, like our kid comes home from like a basketball game, or they've just had a test that day and they come home from school. And some of the common questions, again, just coming from our default brain are like, oh, who won the game? How did you do on the test? And again, this is very subtle, but it's like, we want to know what the result was like, who won? How many goals did you score? How many baskets did you get? And what was your mark on the test? Now, again, it's not bad to ask those questions, but if that's kind of more of our focus, then our kids start to make this connection that what they do and their worth and their acceptance by you is connected to that result. Mm -hmm. And so when that result to them is a failure, like maybe they only get 70% on the test and they know you're not going to be impressed by that, then for one, they're going to be less likely to want to share that with you and talk to you. And two, they're somehow relating like that as a failure, right? If they know that, oh, mom's happy when I get 90 and she's sad when I get 70, they're connecting their acceptance to the result that they're getting. Now, again, it seems very subtle, but it can kind of get dangerous as we go along because they're going to not want to try things. They're is good. They're going to have low confidence. They don't want to put themselves out there because if they are somehow perceived as failing, then they are relating that to their not accepted because, and again, as parents, you are not purposely communicating. I don't accept you just because I'm asking you what, what grade you got on your test. Right. But it's just a matter of noticing it. Right. And so again, you can still ask your kid what grade they got, but maybe do it after 
you've said, Hey, like, what was your favorite part of this course? Like, what did you learn in this course that you're like, so glad you were able to learn? Or what was your, like, what was the most epic part of that basketball game today? Or how did you feel about the way you played today? Like just really focusing on like, not the result, but like, what is the process you went through that maybe ended in that result? Or what, it, what did you learn? What did you gain from this experience that has nothing to do with the result? And as we focus our brains to the process, we help them focus their brains to the process and they are less tied to that result themselves. Right. And they <laughs> see that, Hey, like no matter what I get on this test, I learned something no matter who won the game or how many baskets I got, I learned something. I enjoyed it. There was like this funny moment and like all of these things that are so much more important than the result. And so, yeah, it's just like a really important shift. And it, again, it can be really subtle and it doesn't mean you can't say those other things, but make sure you've got a lot of conversation about the process. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I don't want to get into this, but like, I know there's some people who like reward their kids for grades at the end of the year, or like, you know, they get money or things. And I would just, you know, throw that out there that they may connect some worthiness you know, like I'm good enough as a person, you know, if I get this reward and it's connected to this result, whereas how can we, how can we focus on the process and studying and mm -hmm. so many questions and conversations we can have that have nothing to do with that end result? Yeah. So good. Yeah. Okay. So we had fixing to validating number one, number two was result focus to process focus. Yeah. Let's hear number three. Oh, and just before we move on, I just want to quickly yeah. talk about redefining success and failure. So when we talk about failure, a lot of time it's like, oh, well, we didn't win the game. We failed, or I didn't get this mark on the test. I failed. So again, talking about failure and redefining that together is like not trying, not showing up. Um, and again, failure is kind of a word we actually don't even have to use. <laughs> I hate using failure because it's like, Hey, like I didn't reach, I didn't meet this expectation. That's okay. What did I learn? So mm -hmm. that's one thing I've done with my language is don't use the word failure kind of shift it to like unmet expectation. Like this is an expectation I had. It wasn't met. W you know, what do I want to do with that? And then also defining success as the process, right? I got out there. I studied, I tried a new thing on the trampoline and didn't work out, but that's okay. And really helping our kids see that success is trying, getting out there, you know, being ourselves and being willing to do things that might be hard or scary. So that's part of that conversation. <laughs> so then the third shift is moving from judgment to curiosity. So again, and this is an example that comes up a lot. It's like, okay, my kids didn't do their chores. And what can happen in our brains very easily is we go to a judgment. Oh, my kids aren't trying. My kids are lazy. Or as moms love to do, we judge ourselves. Oh, like what's wrong with me? I didn't teach my kids to, you know, be good workers and pick up after themselves. Like that's my fault. And so there's a lot of judgment that can go on when something our kids do isn't, you know, what we wanted them to do. And so again, when we're doing that in our brain, we're in this place of judgment, whether it's to ourselves or them, the way we show up to them, is more like, Hey, like, what's your problem? Why can't you do this? You know, it's more judgmental, right? And that's not creating connection. And again, that's, you know, when we show up like that, they're like, oh, there's something wrong with me, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this right. I can never get it right. These are like kind of the, the unhelpful thoughts that may be coming up. And so when we can move to curiosity, this opens the door for acceptance. So my kid didn't do his chores. I wonder why so-and-so didn't get to their chores today. Like, Maybe they're not feeling well. Maybe something happened at school that they, you know, are worried about. Like it could be so many things, right? 
maybe they just forgot and they're human and that's okay. And maybe if I just go and say, Hey, like, I noticed that you didn't do your chores today. What's going on, you know, and having that curiosity, because when we show up to our kids with curiosity and we really want to know, like, that's the definition of curious. Like we want to know, we want to learn. And that's such a different way to show up than from a place of judgment. And so, and the other thing I want to point out is that sometimes like we think, okay, curious, that means I ask a question, right? So let's say I was thinking my kid's lazy and I want to move to curiosity and I go to like, I wonder why my kid is lazy. (laughs) That isn't exactly curiosity because you've still got that judgment word in there. So that's just Mm -hmm. my caveat there that not all questions are created equal. Curiosity comes from like that emotion of being curious. So just notice if you're curious, what you think is a curious question is just another way of saying the judgment. So now there's judgment a lot. (laughs) Yeah. So it's like, let go of those judgment words and look at like what's actually happening. So this is where you'd kind of go to like the facts, like, you know, why didn't my son hang his backpack up instead of throwing it on the floor instead of, I wonder why my kid's lazy, right? Mm -hmm. Really get to like, letting go of that judgment in your curiosity, because it's not true curiosity. If you've still got some of those layers of judgment in there. So, yeah. Oh, this is yeah. great. Well, These are, it's nothing overwhelming though, right? It's just small yeah. little shifts and, small shifts and things that make a big difference. Yeah. And the thing is too, is again, like when we're judging our teens and ourselves, that's what they learn to do to Mm -hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So again, when they don't, you know, win the game or they don't, you know, there's something that they're feeling like they're failing at, they're more likely to go to that judgment instead of curiosity. Like, Mm -hmm. Oh, I wonder why, like this particular thing is hard for me. You know, I wonder what I could do to make it easier. I wonder who could help me, you know? And so again, like we're modeling that curiosity for them when we show up in curiosity. And when our kids can move from judgment to curiosity, like those unhelpful kind of negative self-talk thoughts, it's just harder for them to be there when we're in that place of curiosity. And so these shifts just help our kids feel that acceptance, feel that connection and have that model of like, oh, I can validate what I'm thinking and feeling. I can get curious about why you know, things are happening in my life and I can focus on like what I'm learning and what I'm gaining through the process. The result Mm -hmm. isn't that important. I've put these into practice in my own home and I'm sure my kids notice, but I think for me, like it has increased my confidence so much because I know that whatever they come up with, I can either be validating or curious or ask them about what they're learning in the process. Like I know where to put my focus and, and I, I can see it changing for them. And it's interesting because my daughter came in the other day and she was telling me about a problem and I started out being really validating and curious. And then I noticed my brain going to judgment of myself and blaming myself for my child having this problem. And it was so interesting because as soon as I did that, I I saw the connection close. It was like, so interesting to me because I was like, okay, when I start moving away from focusing on helping or connecting with them through validation and curiosity and focus on myself and what I did wrong and judging, I'm no longer, I'm focusing on myself and not them. And all of a sudden that connection is closed. And so I had to go like, take a break and come back and let go of some of that. And when I was able to come back, then we were able to have this really great open conversation and I wasn't blaming myself. I wasn't blaming her. And we were really able to solve a problem and figure out what was really going on. And so these tools, they really do make a difference. They really are amazing. So what I think is so interesting is that, and, and you've alluded to this too, is that as we offer these things to our kids, as we 
you know, move from fixing to validating and from a result focus to process focus and from judgment to curiosity. And we offer that to our kids. Naturally, we're also offering it to ourselves and it yeah. changes us and, totally. and the relationship with ourselves, which will have a direct effect on all, all of our relationships. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And that's a beautiful thing is that when we, you know, create these shifts in an effort to help our teens, we're changing within ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, and also the other thing I wanted to mention is that sometimes making these shifts can be tricky. Like we understand them intellectually, like, okay, I should be curious. I should validate. And sometimes there's emotions that come up for us that keep us from being able to get to that place. And so it's also just noticing that, like noticing what fears come up. Like, I'm afraid my daughter will keep thinking that if I validate it, or, you know, I'm afraid that they won't keep working hard if I don't focus on the result. Like notice those fears that are coming Mm -hmm. up that are keeping you from being able to go to these more helpful communication styles. And again, like be paid, like be curious with yourself, validate yourself, get curious with that emotion and allow that emotion and that fear. And again, like, look at that thought, like, is that really true? And explore that so that you can move to this place where you are validating and being curious and focusing on the process. So, yeah. Yeah. So good. So helpful and really bite-sized. Like it's, it's, it's easy to consume. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right. I, I feel yeah. like if I can do things in threes, I'm good. Like yep. three is like the good number. number. <laughs> yeah, three is good number. <laughs> okay. Lindsay, before we wrap it up today, I would love for you to share with people where they can find more of you. Yeah. Yeah. So I am on Instagram at youth rising coach, lots of good stuff there every week. And then I also have a YouTube channel um, called Youth Rising, and you can link to it either from my website or from Instagram. That being said, my website is www.youthrisingcoach.com. And I'm trying to run monthly parent workshops that kind of take these shifts and like goes a little deeper and helps you like figure out what's keeping you from making that shift and a little more detail there. So information from that will come from my website or from Instagram and um, yeah, great to get in on one of those workshops. Awesome. Fantastic resources. So, so needed and like timeless, right? Like it's just never, the need for that's never going to end. So thank you. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I, yeah, any, any teen you have that is like just struggling with seeing their value. I love coaching teens and tweens. And I also leave a little bit of space in my work life for parenting coaching as well. So like Maybe you have a teen that like, you're noticing these things, but they're just not into it. They're just like, no mom, I'm not talking to someone. (laughs) And that's totally okay. Because when we make those shifts, as we've talked about, it helps our teens as well. So, um, the natural, and it's awesome if we can do it from both ends, but if, you know, some teens, you know, aren't ready for that and that's totally okay. (laughs) And they might not ever be ready for it. And that's totally okay too. Exactly. (laughs) Yep. Oh, Lindsay, thank you so much. It's fantastic. I really have enjoyed this. Um, We will link to all those things in the show notes and look forward to having you again here. And thanks so much for having me, Heather. I really enjoyed it. I loved it. (laughs) All right. We will see you all again next week for another fantastic episode. And thank you, Lindsay, so much for being here today for this one. Appreciate it. No problem. Hey, we just wanted to thank you for spending part of your day here with us at Latter-day Life Coaches and being part of this conversation. Share this with your friends so that you can have a conversation with them on this topic as well. And as always, subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. Have a good one, my friends.